Congratulations, you've made it. We made it through five rapid fire lecture series covering everything from R, our studio and integrated developer environments. Then we went on to Deplier and the family of verbs that allow us to manipulate our data and gain insight into it. Then we went to class three, which had our data visualization tools where we learned ggplot and the grammar of graphics. Finally, in class four and five, we put together the final functions that we need in order to achieve some of these data science goals. So welcome to class six. Class six will be a series of student presentations who went through the same process and same course that you went through. And this is the insight that they gained. All right, so I'm Shannon. I'm in Blanche Capel's lab in cell biology where we study sex determination and development of the gonad. So I use the tidyverse and tidy biology libraries and I ended up importing my own data that was generated in our lab. It's some RNA-seq data for a mutant and then wild type mice at three different embryonic time points. And the mutant mice, they have a mutation called TUR in this protein DND1. And mice that have this mutation will form testicular teratomas and it's a really cool model for uh, cell fate determinations, as it can have all three germ layers. It can grow like hair and teeth and everything in these tumors, which is really cool. So I uploaded that data of my own. And so when you look at it, there's a million different observations and variables. And I only really care about the mean um, expression. And so I'm going to be working with that. And I also use the genes data set. So when I first started with this, uh, data set, the copy that I got from people that I work with in the lab doesn't have any information on what each gene does, which is kind of infuriating when I'm like sorting through it. I'd like to know. So I ended up joining my data set with the genes data set so that I can take the gene description column from the genes data set and correlate that with the genes that are in my data set, if that makes sense. So I did that, and then from there, I'm personally interested in chromatin-modifying proteins and what roles they play during sex determination and development of the gonad. So I filtered the data set to only show me genes that have the word chromatin in the description of their function, and that narrowed down my list a little bit. And at that point, I wanted to start looking at the difference in the mean expression of these different genes between the wild type and the tur mutant mice. So I use mutate, again, to create three new columns that correspond to the mean difference in expression for mutant and wild type at the three different time points. So the data set returned some interesting results. And so I used a variant of the lollipop plot called the conditional color plot, which is really just a fancy bar graph that then changes the colors of the bars based on whether or not they're above or below an inputted threshold. So here you can see all of the chromatin modifying proteins that I filtered out of the original data set. Um, it's a little bit much to look at. And so just for the ease of showing you guys, I pulled out just the bath complex, which is part of the switch SNP uh, chromatin modifying complex. It's one of the forms. Um, and so you can see here, this is the difference in mean expression of the bath complex members at embryonic day 12.5. I chose this date because it's closest to sex determination um, in mutant mice relative to the wild type mice. And so some of my conclusions were that across the board for these chromatin modifying complexes, there's no real trend really in if one complex is, all of the members in that complex are increased in expression or decreased. Um, so moving forward, this is actually a really cool way for me to use this data set as before I was just kind of staring at it and copy like finding things and it was awful. So going forward, I'm probably gonna start filtering more to include histone demethylases and other things that um, modify chromatin, um, and then I can pair that with some of the ataxic data that's coming out of our lab to see what the chromatin environment looks like further. So thanks to Jan Holtz for the plot inspiration, the instructors of this course, and here's my session information. Question. Okay, so just to give you a sense of like the order, so um, Telmo's up next, then Ali and Akshay, no, just kidding, uh, <laughs> Madison, Alan, Molly, Carrie, and so on.
All right. Um, so I am Tom Moganga, um, and I'm currently a first year rotating in Brussels at your lab, um, where I'm studying AV and aftermaths and any overlap that they may have. Um, so I just used one of the data sets from class, um, and it was uh, actually an inner join between the genes and the proteins data set. Um, so basically, it was uh, the inner join joins uh, uh, values from x and y present in a column that you determine um, that are matching between the two. So unlike a full join, you have uh, only the variables that match. So it would be the genes that encode for proteins. Um, and I am I mostly care about um, the protein length um, and the transcript length. Um, so basically, I started by just plotting those two things against each other. Um, but I noticed that, uh, so you can see a line sort of uh, at the three to one ratio, but then below there's some more data that I wasn't sure where it came from because it takes three nucleotides to encode an amino acid. So in an attempt to data clean it a little bit, um, I went ahead and uh, used the filter function. Um, so I got rid of everything that was under three translator ratio. And that line that we see here accents more and this data set. Um, so then I went ahead and since this wasn't very informative, um, I did use the cup, using the cup function, I put uh, my data into bins uh, for protein length and I analyzed the translator ratio, which is a variable that I obtained uh, by mutating and getting uh, the ratio of transcript length to protein length. Um, and then, so then we have the ratio of how many nucleotides it takes to encode this protein and then proportion to the length of the protein. Um, and we can see a trend here um, with smaller proteins being more variable and how many nucleotides it takes to encode them or larger ones um, generally take uh, less variable uh, amount of nucleotides as well as closer to uh, fewer nucleotides overall relative to their length. Um, and then I went ahead and did a little more data cleaning um, since I wanted to try to get, uh, see if this was, there was a trend by chromosome. Um, so my final graph, uh, basically I plotted this translated ratio over the chromosome. And for this chromosome, I basically split a column that had the chromosome uh, scaffold um, into different stuff and then took out uh, variables that weren't numeric. Um, so then I was able to get this graph that shows there's not much difference um, amongst chromosomes. However, um, when doing statistics for the first graph that I have here, where we think we see maybe a trend, um, by crystal wallace test, Ransom test, which is uh, non-parametric, so it's a little more, it gives a little more freedom to the data. Um, and I don't have to do as many tests as if I was doing a parametric test. Um, it showed me that there was a significant value amongst the groups. However, in order to determine if particular groups had significant values amongst them, I used the parallel Wilcox test, which is also non-parametric. Um, and we can see very significant differences in smaller protein sizes uh, compared to larger ones. Um, and then between, amongst the larger protein sizes, amongst the, there's not as much difference, but um, there's definitely a very strong uh, uh, significance uh, of smaller proteins having larger uh, coding uh, regions. Um, so that's basically uh, the main finding. Um, so we find uh, no difference between chromosomes, but strong correlation of protein size to translated protein. And the prioritized follow-ups will be to repeat this analysis, uh, since I wasn't really uh, sure if you know data sets could influence any of this if I, you know, there was any errors in my data cleaning or anything. Um, mainly because of this weird trend of this noise here that I wasn't sure how to interpret. Um, so I will repeat this uh, with this data set containing the same variables but obtained um, just from the internet. Um, and uh, just uh, trying to see if there's correlation of these results to genomic coordinate distribution. Um, and carrying out uh, a similar analysis as this, uh, but studying maybe the promoter regions. 
um, just to see if there is any trend of promoter region size experimentally determined to uh, the protein length encoded and the uh, ratio of translator protein uh, to protein length. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Questions? Sorry. So one, uh, one thing you guys should get in the habit of doing is after you, um, when you wrap up, you say, like, thank you. Sometimes at a conference, you'll say, thank the organizers for the invitation. Thank you for your attention. And the way that you let the audience know that you're done is by saying, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. Because otherwise, it's like this awkward, like, do I clap? Do I not clap? Is there more? Is there another? You know, et cetera. So um, just one thing that you guys can all do is. Hi, I'm Madison. I'm in uh, Dr. Ashley Cook's lab, and I used um, the subcell data set, which has information on um, protein localization and the OMIM gene map, which describes um, the genes that are known to be associated in Mendelian diseases. And I was interested in seeing if there was an enrichment for genes associated with Mendelian diseases in certain um, so compartments, so I combined the two data sets using the gene ID, um, which wasn't the same, so I had to like convert it in one and then match them together. Um, and made sure that there was no errors. Um, and then I found, this graph shows, the percent of uh, Mendelian genes in each cellular compartment. Um, but I, whenever I was combining the data sets, I found that I lost a lot, and I didn't think this was as informative. What I'd really like to do is figure out all of the genes and um, the, the percentage of all characterized genes in cellular compartments, and then figure out what percent of those are involved in Mendelian diseases. Um, so I've been trying to, for a long time in my own project, combine these two graphs together. It's um, One's called a donut graph. It looks like a pie chart, but it has a circle. Well, it should look something like this, where like you have one group of data on the inside of the circle that represents a portion of a whole, and then it can be like further uh, sub-characterized into different categories. So where what I was trying to do was make like this um, portion, the percentage of all genes in a given region and then this be like which percent of those genes within that region are associated with Mendelian diseases. Um, this was really difficult. So that's my first, it, it says final, but this is just the first attempt. Um, and it got a little better. So like for this example right here, that's the percentage of all genes in extracellular, um, in the extracellular compartment and this small chunk right here are the percentage of the extracellular localized proteins that are involved in Mendelian diseases. Um, but I spent way too much time on this graph than I probably should have, and it didn't really, like, I mean, it's not as good, I mean, it's not like paper quality, you know, so I um, eventually gave up on it. It needs more work, but then I uh, just plotted them like this. So these are the percentages, uh, percentage of Mendelian genes um, in each cellular compartment that have been normalized by the total number of genes in each compartment. And you can see that uh, the cytoplasm is enriched, which I thought was interesting. But um, I, what I think would be more interesting is if like, I could overlay this information with commonalities in protein function. So like now I know the proteins are going to the cytoplasm, what are they doing in the cytoplasm? Is there some kind of similarity between um, commonly the commonalities and function of Mendelian genes? Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> I think it was really important to uh, normalize um, based on the number of 
genes in your uh, per compartment, right? So you're just not looking at um, here's a lot of genes in this compartment, a bit like you know, here's a chromosome with a lot of base pairs, and it happens to be bigger than everybody else. So I like that. Good job. All right. So I uh, imported um, or used the data for proteins, genes, subcell, and uh, mendelian genetics. Um, basically, just trying to find some way to look at genes specifically in the proteins they make and try to uh, localize them to where in the cell um, these uh, genetic diseases can appear. Um, so just importing data, visualizing data. Uh, and so first I explored these, um, but first graphing them according to the um, cellular localization and looking, so this is all of the um, length of proteins versus like where in the cell, uh, cellular localization, like where they're located. Um, and so I specifically wanted to focus on those that are linked to the uh, Mendelian genetics. So I basically just, um, ended up linking those and just using those specific ones that were actually in cross-referencing the other database. Um, and then from there, uh, there were a lot of them that actually had um, didn't have a phenotype in the database. So I got rid of those and just focused on those with a specific phenotype. Um, and then uh, specifically focused on um, these four compartments, the cytoplasm, extracellular, membrane, and the nucleus. Um, so these are just genes that have basically all of those values in across all of those tables. Um, and so what I wanted to do was basically look at the GC contact, uh, content of these genes. Um, and so specifically focusing on these four compartments because they had the most, um, I guess, uh, genes available in that data set. Um, and where is the, oh. So then I decided to do this kind of graph, basically um, just looking at in terms of um, how much of these genes were actually um, having like this high GC content versus like their transcript length. Um, and so this really didn't tell me much, um, to be honest. I was expecting all of them to kind of be more appear, maybe like you know, more GC content means like more rate of mutations and um, that's why maybe they're like disease linked. Uh, but I think the most interesting one that I saw was the one for the nucleus, because these kind of have, for the cytoplasm, extracellular, and the membrane, they kind of have the same pattern where they have about 40% GC content at low transcripts, for instance. But this one's a little bit higher. Um, so I think overall, I think the next kind of like a follow up study would be to look at specifically like rate of mutations um, and specifically focus on the nucleus to see if there's a correlation between the GC content and how likely this gene could get mutated. Um, but, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, so I want to acknowledge uh, Matthew, Akashi, Akshay, and Ali for uh, just helping us out throughout the course. Um, and pretty much done. So I can take any questions if anyone has any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Question. No. What was the name of the plot? The oh, it's a density plot. Like density. A stat. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to change the color. Um, couldn't figure that out. Yeah. yeah, but. You should call it like a golf course plot or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's cool. Yeah. 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 Maybe you're not asking to put your heads together and think about mutations and places where the. Um, uh, 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 genes that are associated with disease and so on.
All right. Okay, Molly. All right, so this is my final project. Um, first of all, I originally wanted to use my own data for this, but I just could not get it to work out with all the data cleaning. So big props to everyone who was able to pull that off for this final project. Um, so instead, I went back to our tried and true chromosome data set that we used in class. And in looking at the data, what I thought um, might be interesting, something that we didn't spend too much time actually working with during the course was all of this different RNA data that is included in the chromosome data set. So I started to think about how I might visualize that to try and get an idea of the different types of RNA that are represented on the chromosomes. So I started with some simple bar graphs and I kind of had this dream that I could get a cool bar graph with all of these different types of RNAs maybe having their own colored blocks and looking at the distribution between the different chromosomes um, and I kind of ended up with this weighting scenario with the gradient because all of these were continuous variables. Um, I ended up having a hard time actually getting what I wanted. So I decided to forget about the bar graphs and go on a different journey with the data. <laughs> so what I decided to do was instead of trying to look at the different categories of RNA on the chromosomes, um, I would instead add up some of the categories of RNA and just try and get an idea of the total amount of each chromosome that is encoding RNA. So to do that, I started with a really simple mutate function um, and just added together the total long non-coding RNA and the total small non-coding RNA uh, from this chromosome data set and made it into a new chromosome 2 data set. And I graphed this using uh, just one of our simple geom smooth plots. And what I thought was interesting, um, I'm showing here the total RNA uh, based on the number of base pairs in the chromosome. But whether I did it for base pairs um, or the total length, I kind of saw this interesting inflection point in the data, which I thought was weird because whenever we looked at other things like protein coding genes, uh, we usually saw a pretty linear relationship with the longer the chromosome, the more of whatever that thing is was going to be on the chromosome. So I thought it was interesting that there was an inflection point in the data when I looked at the total RNA. So what I decided to do next was try and get an idea if there were particular data points that were pulling this up and down and making this inflection point happen. So I just overlaid the chromosome numbers on the data set and what I found was that there were a few that had maybe more than you would expect RNA um, according to the size of the chromosome or less than you would expect. Um, so to make the final graph I kind of wanted to make this a little more interesting to look at, um, and I kind of drew inspiration from Matt's example where he used a percentage instead of just the raw number. So I did another little mutate to look at the total RNA divided by the base pairs to get an idea of the percentage um, according to the number of base pairs, and then just added some labels and things to make the graph a little bit nicer. And what I ended up seeing was that whenever I took down the percentage of non-coding RNA, uh, comparing it to the base pairs, for these chromosomes kind of on the left side that are in the smaller populations, there's a pretty big variation uh, of how much RNA will be encoded by that chromosome. But then whenever we get to the longer ones, it kind of evens out and starts to have a more definite trend. So I thought it was interesting to see um, how in the shorter ones, it's really variable, but in the longer chromosomes, it kind of evens out a little bit. But a couple of caveats about this analysis. Um, first of all, you look at the axis and these are incredibly small percentages, so it's not really an extreme difference that we're seeing. Um, and then I also started to think about, I'm pretty sure the data set is representing the number of non-coding RNAs uh, as opposed to the actual length of the RNAs. So for a future analysis, it would be interesting to actually look at what length of RNA is encoded by each chromosome and maybe analyze that instead. Uh, so for acknowledgments, thank you for everyone teaching the class. Um, I learned a lot about using RStudio, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Does anybody have any wild predictions on how to solve the first problem? About how to um, take the different um, types of RNA and plot them in a stacked um, uh, bar chart?
Anyone? Yeah, this is a chromosome data frame. Essentially what you do is you try to take alleys, um, pivot longer, and you pivot all of the different types of um, RNA um, into one column. So you would have a column that's like called type of RNA, and then one that's just all of the numbers. Because in order to have multiple like variables like that in one, you need a new column that essentially is a categorical variable to then be able to use to like fill and then stack on top and something like that. So, okay. Where were we? Gary. Gary. <laughs> okay, so my name's Carrie, and I'm in the Ready Lab, and I'm really interested generally in the non-coding genetic variation that contributes to um, different complex traits and diseases, so, and um, involved in gene regulation, but I can't really look at that here. Everything was mostly coding. So what I thought would be really interesting to do is look at the um, OMIM gene map data sets for how many um, Mendelian disease associations were involved, were mapped to each chromosome, and um, then use also the chromosome data set to map those back to their um, chromosome, and then I can look at the amount of um, genetic variation that's within each of those chromosomes as well. So basically, just to start off, I wanted to visualize the OMIM entries, entries that were on each of these chromosomes, just with like a simple bar graph. So I saw a pretty general trait that longer chromosomes contain more Mendelian disease associations, which makes sense to me. But I also um, wanted to directly look at the genetic variation that's also contained within these uh, chromosomes, because as we had seen from Matt's example previously, not all of the chromosomes have as uh, a linear relationship of genetic variation with chromosome length. So I started off with just a really simple little dot plot um, to check this out. And you can kind of see generally, um, I calculated the percent of OMIM entries in each chromosome. So I normalized by the length of the chromosome. Um, and then also calculated the percent variation like we've seen in the past, just again, divided by the length of the chromosome. Um, and you see a general trend, but it's a little hard to figure, to tell what's going on here. So for my final graph, I labeled all of the chromosomes and also um, added a linear regression line so that you can tell which chromosomes follow the line pretty closely and which are um, sitting outside of that line. And so from this, I'm con basically concluding that generally more genetically diverse chromosomes um, contain more Mendelian disease associations. And then there are some um, exceptions, including the sex chromosomes and chromosome 22, for example, which I actually have no idea why. So in uh, my follow-up studies, that would definitely be something to look into um, why some of these chromosomes have less coding um, Mendelian disease associations. And also, this uh, OMIM data set only contains disease associations from protein coding regions of the genome. And um, so I think that it would be better to compare the amount of OMIM entries with the protein coding variation within each of the chromosomes, not just generally the variation along each of the chromosomes. And then for my personal interest, I think it would be really interesting to um, check what the total genetic variation for each chromosome, how that looks compared to like uh, the number of genome-wide association hits within a chromosome, because that would include not just protein coding um, associated regions and variants with disease, but also non-coding regions. So uh, thank you to Dr. Hershey and our TAs, and uh, I'll take any questions if you guys have any. Questions? 
So I didn't expect this, but I really like seeing um, you guys being skeptical about your own data and saying, well, I plotted this versus this and it shows a relationship, but it turns out that might not be so relevant. Like Harry just said, we have um, you know, total variation, but we're looking at specific genes. So what we should do is really normalize to the amount of you know, variation per gene, not across the entire um, chromosome. Like that's, um, that's awesome to hear because um, what that means is that when you guys then are looking at data or um, you know, listening to people uh, present their findings, you, you sort of have this um, you know, superpower, right? Where you can say, well, that's, if you compare this and that, that doesn't make sense, but if you compare it and so on. So I, I, like, I like seeing that. Um, I, my name is Faraz. Um, I'm in Ken Foster's lab, my second year soon. Um, we normally study uh, regeneration in the heart, but what I'm going to use for now is just the data that's been provided for us. Um, so what I did was basically combine the subcellular data, the genes, and the protein data, because I really just wanted to look at, I was able to uh, combine the proteins and the genes and then look at their subcellular location. Um, and my initial analysis was just trying to see um, the abundance of proteins within each other compartment and trying to see that how those abundances or those if there's a relationship between size and abundance within each uh, compartment and then you can see it over here um, there's not much differences I mean larger compartments generally have a lot lot, lot more proteins such as the cytoplasm the extracellular membrane um, the extracellular uh, compartments the membrane of the nucleus um, so then I just thought to just narrow it down to let's say particular type of protein. So um, I'm really interested in signaling proteins uh, uh, looking at kinases. So I thought I could just just look at all the kinases within each compartment and you start to see that there's a, a lot more uh, larger difference with the cytoplasm having a lot more kinases and the membrane and the nucleus, which sort of uh, is intuitive because signaling cascade, which can occur at the membrane then go through the cytoplasm into the nucleus. That's how generally most kinases work. So you would see that sort of a trend. But then I also look back at the original graph and you see that there's a lot more proteins in those compartments already. So I did to try to do was to normalize it to the total number of proteins is the ratio of kinases to the total number of proteins that are within each compartment. And what's striking to see is that the centrosome generally has a higher ratio of kinases to uh, all other proteins within that compartment. Um, while the side of Asm still has higher, but I felt like this was the main outlier. Um, and I felt that maybe that could be because um, there's a lot more signaling happening at the centrosome during mitosis. Um, there wasn't much else I could peel out of it, but just um, it was just like strikingly different to me that just uh, popped out. Um, with that, I just want to thank uh, all the instructors of the class. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'll take any questions. Um, so just filter them out, filter them out, um, and you can filter out with the string that's within the protein name. So just write in kinase and it just filters out. Thank you. Yeah, we uh, we didn't go over. Um, there's another package uh, part of the Tidyverse called Four Cats, and uh, Four Cats is a package that is used for um, factoring, um, and so if you have factors in your data, which uh, is a special type of categorical variable, you can then use this to um, handle some of your categorical variables, like rename them or do other um, you know, types of uh, transformations to, uh, to these. So uh, I just mention it because um, for your own learning beyond this class, if you want to look into the forecast package, you can start uh, getting a little bit more sophisticated with how you're plotting your factors of the long cats. Say so try again. Okay. Just try to block it. So hi everyone, my name is Shirei and I'm second year. Currently I'm in Dr. Solinger's lab. 
And I work with Optimer, and it's not really related to any of the packages available, but I, I just gonna choose a random one. So the one that I chose is actually the file uh, named Mitocarta. And I'm not familiar with this one, so I look it up, what's this file included? And turn out this is the inventory that have like 1158 human and MRS genes that are coding proteins with strong support for mitochondrial localization. So actually the first step that I did was try to clean out this setup because this file that in the um, tidy biology environment does actually contain, like the observations have more than 1900. So that's definitely the least file that I want to work with. So the first thing that I did was actually use this code, try to clean up the data and make sure the final data only contained the one that identified by this metal card or two. So when you take a glimpse of this figure, you can see there was like a lot of variables. And in this one is have like, after cleaning up, it has 1158 observations. So what I'm really interested in is to say whether these genes that have different uh, mitochondrial domains. So this, actually this um, file contains three different mitochondrial domain scores, which means, so the metal domain means the proteins that only have exclusively mitochondrial domain. And the non metal domain is means it exclusive have non mitochondrial domain. And the share just means it's ambiguous. It's either have it or not, which doesn't really make sense to me, but this is how they showed. And in here, I just plot the main line of this each categories. And as I can see, like it's not though, it's not like super significant, but the one for the non metal domain actually have like a reduced expression. So the x axis is the plot of this. Um, mass spec, this is a result to say whether the intensity of mass spec, which means I, in my understanding is related to how much this gene expressed. So it turns out the proteins that have the non mitochondrial domain have the least expression level among others. So next I go ahead to ask whether this protein is actually specific expressed in certain tissues. So I did is to say whether they expressed upon all the tissues they examined. So if this is true, that means they, ex uh, they express in all 14 tissues they examine it. If it's false, which means there are somehow specificity of this expression of protein. So for the final graph, I really want to say for these proteins that have non mitochondrial domains, which type of tissue they prefer to be expressed. And I just graph this and turn out for the proteins that has non mitochondrial domain, it turned to likely express in placenta, which is kind of surprised to me because I always thought like, if you have proteins expressed with or without mitochondrial domain, you probably have a favorite to have like expressed in the heart or like skeletal muscles, which turn out have like more mitochondrial activities. But for this type of proteins, it's actually in placenta. So one thing that I didn't do this is to um, standardize like the many numbers of the proteins that actually express in this, each tissues. So this tendency that I saw may not because they, the preference of the specific proteins may just proteins in general have like more expressions into those tissues. So that's also the final directions. And at the end, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Thanks, Dr. Earlier yeah. on, you used the grapple function, which is cool. You, you didn't cover that. Did you, why did you use that instead of like filter? Oh, this is like. I think this is density. This is a density function. Oh no, no, no your very first slide. Oh, when here. You get the one that This zero. one. Yeah. Oh. When did you filter equal one? Because actually, like for this one, I didn't really notice like this data wasn't that clean until this morning. So I just okay. do a quick Google to say okay, how I okay. could yeah. like just grab the content that I want, yeah. and this is like show up in the first Google result, and I use it. It works, so I just stick with it. <laughs> yeah. That was great. Thanks. Yeah, so this, uh, uh, so GrepL is another way to, um, it's the base R way to um, handle strings. And so um, what she's looking for are zeros. And so there's a column in here um, that essentially has uh, approximately 2,000 uh, proteins in it. And there's a, a, a binary uh, value whether or not that protein is um, included in the final list or not. And the final list is 1158. So that's where that sort of step came from uh, with the realization that um, right, you were looking at 2,000 proteins instead of 1158. So one, one way would to, to simply say, is this a bona fide mitochondrial protein, is to use the 
um, variable in here, um, which is um, included in Mitocarta 2.0 final list or not. And um, I think it was, a I don't know if it's still a true false. It was originally a true false. And, um, and so remember one is true, zero is false. So you could have done the same thing instead of the bang operator for not grepple. You could have just said um, is true for one instead of zero. But as you guys know and are seeing, um, there's a lot of different ways uh, to do things. So Tim, no? OK. All right, we just got three more minutes. Great. All right, Joe. All right. Um, so I'm Joe, um, I'm in the Keaton lab and we study influenza viruses. And this weekend I actually got um, data back from like an eight month long CRISPR screen that I've been doing. So I was a little bit more excited about the CRISPR screen in this class, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> and I decided to do two birds with one stone and uh, use some of the CRISPR data in my presentation today. Um, so just to uh, look at the data that I imported, um, our CRISPR data set, contains uh, gene names, and so I was able to overlap those with the existing protein and chromosome data sets in the tidy biology set. Um, and we also have uh, something called a sort score, which um, isn't important for what we're talking about. This screen was actually about like a protein trafficking during flu infection, but that's not important for the data analysis section. Um, and um, I made this new variable called inverse score, which is just a little bit more intuitive for um, a higher score corresponds with a more confident gene hit. Um, so that's what I'm working with at the beginning. So um, naturally, I wanted to see where these uh, hits ended up in the cell. Um, so I graphed them just like this uh, very quickly. Um, and I got really excited because I was like, oh, there's a bunch localized to the cytoplasm and the membrane, um, the extracellular space. And we're looking at this extracellular protein trafficking. So I thought naturally that that's where it would end up. So I wanted to look at that, uh, or that's where protein hits that control this process would end up. Um, so I wanted to visualize this with a bar graph, which was actually a lot harder to make than I thought it would be, or a pie chart, sorry, um, which was a lot harder to make than I thought it was going to be. Um, so major props to Madison for uh, having those really cool ones. Um, so I still got really excited by this. Um, and then I realized, wow, I don't know what the total uh, proteins look like in a cell. Um, so I should probably look at proteins globally to see if it's exactly represented or it's represented the same way as this. Um, and indeed, it is represented the exact same way globally in the cell. So when I um, expected all my hits to be within these like different cellular locations, um, it makes sense that the number of them that are there controlling a process is going to be representative of the total global ones in the cell. So I had to abandon that logic um, a little bit. Um, so then I moved on to actually see where my hits were mapping to chromosomes. Um, and you can see that uh, it was a whole genome CRISPR screen. So I did actually find hits on every chromosome. Um, for some reason, I couldn't get this bottom axis to be an actual numerical order. So it doesn't go one to like Y here. Uh, and that's because some of these are strings and I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to get them into order. So that you're just gonna have to look at it like that, sorry. Um, but I actually got pretty excited here because um, some of these hits look like they're clustering um, and genes in different clusters can sort of um, tell us that they're doing the same function or it can give us some clues about um, the confidence uh, if, um, in those hits if we get a lot of hits that are in the same gene cluster. Um, so for my final graph, I wanted to um, associate the gene hit rank from our CRISPR screen with the um, clusters. And a couple of these actually got me pretty excited, um, and I'm excited to follow up to see what's exactly in these clusters, because um, a red uh, rank here actually corresponds with a higher confidence gene hit. And um, so uh, this little section on chromosome 1 is getting me a little bit excited, and as well as this um, place on chromosome 16. Uh, there's a little bit on chromosome 22 also, but that chromosome is actually shorter, so I'm not sure if those are just closer together because it's a shorter chromosome or not. 
Um, but yeah, so uh, from that, I was able to actually learn a little bit about my actual lab data set, which I thought was really cool. Um, and to follow up, I definitely want to look to see what specific genes are representing those clusters. I couldn't find an easy way to do that right away, but it's something that I'm going to look into in the future. Um, and I used a lot of these different references, um, mostly GitHub, especially this one guy who totally helped me make my data look cleaner by changing the axes so that everything didn't overlap. Um, so with that, I will take any questions. I could talk about it for days, but um, uh, basically we were sorting for cells that didn't traffic a viral protein to the surface of a cell. So we incubated it with an antibody and then used flow sorting to figure out what didn't bind the antibody. Okay. So uh, a couple of things, that's great, thank you. Um, I hope that um, your guys' own research will always be more interesting uh, and important than the classes that you guys are required to take. So um, that, that's not only allowed, but uh, expected. Uh, the second thing, um, the reason that it's a string and that those are factors, uh, the, the chromosome numbers are factors, is because there's an X and Y chromosome. So it can't, you can't turn that to numeric. If you do, and you force it to become a numeric, we didn't teach you how to do that, but that's possible, um, those then will drop out. Um, so the, what you have to do is you have to manually um, it, it's called a level the factors or re-level the factors. And so this is what I had to manually do after I scraped the data because the very first time I made a chromosome data set, I um, had the exact same problem that you did. So I did that, but then when I made the tidy uh, biology uh, data sets, I made sure that those factors were included along with the data set. So um, unless, you know, until you start changing that data set and adding more information to it, like you did, um, those should be factors that, uh, that uh, carry along. So. Um, anyhow, um, if you really want the code, I have it. It's actually, it's online. I can just point you to it. So, all right. And then, um, one, one last thing actually, and this is, um, this is on the science. So the, um, the, the thing to keep in mind, as far as we know, chromosomal position doesn't mean, uh, anything in the context of mammalian gene organization. So. So keep that in mind, like it's interesting that there's these relationships and we can like go into this, but um, you know, bacteria have operons and um, some other organisms have some logical uh, genomic organization. So on one hand, it might be really interesting that all of those cluster together, but keep the caveat in mind, it might be totally random. And if you completely shuffled, you know, all of the genes and their locations that you would get, you know, some clustering together and some far apart. So um, I think actually that's an interesting data science problem is to ask a question about um, genomic organization of genes in the, um, in the human um, genome, but that's uh, so far, as far as we know, there's there's no rational uh, organization. Factors. Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm a second year in Nico Optics lab. I study Epstein Barr virus, and I don't have any cool new data, so I just went back to basics for this um, and used our um, genes and subcell data sets. So um, I was trying to figure out what to do, and I was trying to see what kind of um, variables overlap between these data sets. So I noticed um, I could look at gene names. So I combined these two data sets um, using the inner join function, um, filtering on gene name. And when I looked at my new data set, I saw that I had more variables. So I was confident that my inner join function worked. Um, so then for my first graph, I wanted to know if there was a relationship between the percent gene uh, GC content of transcripts and subcellular location. So I just did a box plot and noticed that over here, we had one that was sort of looked different than the others. But as you can see, my, uh, my graph doesn't look so great. So I decided to clean this up a little bit and see if I could get some more information from it. So, I uh, cleaned it up, I made the legend look a little bit better, I colored it, and noticed that the vacuole seemed to have a um, lower percent 
uh, GC content of translated transcripts um, compared to other subcellular locations, and also the variation um, of the uh, GC content was less in that subcellular location, which I thought was fairly interesting. Um, so um, my conclusions from this were that the transcripts that are eventually translated into proteins have a really big range of GC content, um, except for in the back rule, which seems to be um, there's less variation and less GC content um, in that subcellular location. So um, I wanted to know, like, if I was going to follow up on this, like, does this lower GC content um, in the vacuole mean that there's like a higher turnover of proteins there? Um, are they like intrinsically less stable? Is there a biological consequence to this? Um, so, so that was a cool little finding. Um, so yeah, thanks to everybody here. Thanks to the internet for helping me a lot. <laughs> um, and yeah, and that's it. If anybody has any questions? Questions? For the record, I think these are really cool data sets, but that's just my opinion. Um, no, I think one of the, um, I guess, fun things about this data science field and activity is that uh, we can ask questions of data that we previously couldn't ask. So, um, you know, it does. You don't need some like super sexy CRISPR screen data to you know, you know to present or whatever. Like you can ask. Um, uh, I'm sure there's going to be like gold in there, right? Uh, but you can ask like really simple questions that previously we weren't able to ask about relationships, and that's that's the whole that's the whole idea. Hi, I'm Julia, and I am a second year in John Perfect's lab. Um, we study fungal pathogenesis, which is not anything related to what I'm going to talk about. Um, so I started out looking at our protein data set. I was like, okay, what can this tell me? And I really liked that it incorporated the sequence there. Um, so a previous project that I worked on looked at this class of proteins called uh, the WD40 protein. Um, whoever came up with it was very punny. Um, and so they're a beta propeller protein, and they are non-enzymatic, and they just create a scaffold that other protein-protein interactions can occur on. And they're characterized by this very long consensus sequence, which we're learning more and more that the first part of this doesn't really mean anything, and it's this anchor that's the most important part. So I wanted to incorporate this consensus sequence, which was at first a little bit intimidating, but after... Uh, uh, looking into Slack overload about how to use or instead of, or one of, um, instead of all these, I was able to pull out um, about 60 potential WD proteins from uh, the human genome proteins uh, data set. And so at first I wanted to just search it because I didn't know if this consensus sequence was going to work. Um, and I got some hits, and I was happy about that. And so I filtered based on true, based on whether they were WD proteins. Um, and I then decided to integrate the proteins um, and the subcellular locations data set. So I wanted to ask the question, where are these guys located? Um, and so both of these data sets had gene name as um, one of the variables. And so that made it very easy to um, interjoin these two data sets to only give the information about WD40 proteins that were in this. So my idea is what I originally intended to do is to um, graph number of proteins based on subcellular locations, and I wanted to add a little bit information about the confidence score, because um, I thought that was an important component. I tried it a couple different times, and for some reason, which I'm sure with more hours on Slack overload I could have figured out, but five seemed enough, um, <laughs> I could only get um, this confidence score, I, I tried 
making it a numeric, but it said it was already a number and then it was discrete versus continuous. And so I was like, I don't care about the number. I just need to know like degree of confidence. And so what I ended up doing is filling it based on this score and reverse the gray scale gradient. So the darker it is, the more confident the score is. So we see an abundance of like pretty high quality calls in the cytoplasm, the membrane and the nucleus, um, and then some of these other proteins that don't have such a degree of uh, confidence. So after that, I wanted to take a look at um, number of proteins uh, explore that confidence score a little bit because you can't really infer much from that previous graph about it um, and throw on another uh, dimension in protein length. And so what I found was a bit interesting was the cytoplasm um, had a lot of very large WD-40 proteins, which makes sense because where do a lot of the large metabolic and uh, cellular processes happen? In the cytoplasm. Um, but I, what I did find very interesting is some of these really tiny um, proteins found in the nucleus. And most of these I went back and looked at the data set don't have um, a known function. And so I think for my follow-up studies, I would want to know what are these guys attaching to um, and what they're possibly doing. So, and I would very much like to thank uh, Stack Overflow, um, Matt, Ellie, and Akshay as well. And with that, any questions? Yes. I think to do with the confidence is you could convert that to a categorical variable. So like four to five is very confident. Three. Oh, okay. Confident. And then you could. Got it. Instead of having the numbers as like a factor. Exactly. So okay. You can make a new column. Okay. You can Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Um, one quick question that I have. Um, did you find in your list any positive controls? So in your list of like 60, right, you do this you know, string detect, yeah. you end up with a bunch of trues, and you filter on true. And then, right, I don't know anything about the yeah. WD-40s other than it's like a spray, right? Um, <laughs> so, so one of the things that we like to do is um, Gain confidence mm -hmm. in, you know, oh, this completely makes sense. This is the canonical. So tell us what, like, what yeah, you saw in there. Um, so these WD40 proteins are a lot in um, DNA damage uh, mechanisms. So mm -hmm. they're the stuff that can like bring all the other factors together to, to uh, uh, repair DNA. Mm -hmm. And that was a hit in there. And also some G protein coupled receptors, um, which are, you know, beta propeller proteins. Okay. And they were Great. Awesome. Yeah. And then um, one last caveat for the entire class. So um, that subcell uh, data set, that's a real live data set. I, um, you, know, you can look in the package about notes of like where it came from and everything. What I did to try to make it easy for you guys is to clean it up. So it turns out that um, in that data set, there's um, a protein, and that protein then has multiple subcellular locations that it's associated with and multiple confidence scores. So what I did to make it easy for you guys, so I tried to clean it by saying, okay, let's just take one, let's take the highest, um, you know, the most confident place, and I kept the scores in there for you. Um, you know, the thing is, though, um, there's a bunch of different um, confidences for, let's say, five, um, the maximum score. And let's say it's both in the membrane and in the nucleus, and the score is five. Well, I arbitrarily chose one of those. So, again, this is real, it's live, but this also not complete. It's not completely reflecting like, oh, my favorite protein is not where, where it should be. In fact, one of the most obvious things is if you count and you look at um, how many mitochondrial proteins are annotated in the subcell, it's like 500, right? But we just heard there's like a thousand in mitochondria. So we know that, you know, some proteins aren't um, always annotated where they should be. So just, again, these are, these are data sets that you guys can use for your own work and um, you know, all of these things, but um, just realize that there are some caveats that make complete sense. And if you end up using it for your work and you have questions about these data sets in like years to come, just, just ask. Okay. All right. Next. Okay. 
Hi, um, I'm Jun Chi, and uh, I'm a first year PCB student rotating in Andrew West lab. We worked on LAR2 and its mutations influence on uh, Parkinson disease. Um, however, my data set isn't about uh, that. Um, I picked the chromosome um, data set um, that everybody has been working on for a while. And then um, to get a general, more general sense of the data set, I use the scan function um, to check uh, some basic statistical pro uh, properties of each variable. Um, however, I kind of want to focus up more on the chromosomes rather than variables. So um, I did this correlation analysis um, across all the factors in the data set. And interestingly, all of them are positively, positively correlated by a certain degree. Um, so inspired by the new PCB faculty ZD's research topic on um, regulatory gene elements. Um, I use I picked the pseudogenes. Um, I picked the pseudogenes and the protein coding genes, um, and I normal I normalize them by the uh, by the chromosome length, and the result is that um, I feel like some people might think that uh, the more pseudogene you have the less protein genes you will get, but it is the opposite. Um, so I added the court, uh, quartile lines and the smooth lines, and you can see that Y chromosome is definitely an outlier, um, and it influenced a lot on the trend line. So I want to focus more on that chromosome. Um, so I did... The, uh, I made this plot about the pseudogenes percentage on each chromosome, and um, I found out that, so primarily I found out that the Y chromosome has a very high degree of, a uh, high percentage of pseudogenes, and that kind of reminds me of Dr. Uh, Hershey's example image of how the variation is the lowest in um, Y chromosome, so I added that here for more information. Um, and so the conclusion is the Y chromosome has way more uh, pseudogene percentage over the all the um, other uh, than other chromosomes uh, do, uh, but it has a way lower variation compared to other chromosomes. Um, so originally, I my original thought about the uh, pseudogenes is that because they don't have uh, the allergen pressure, uh, they usually will introduce more variations. But this result is kind of like shocked me a bit because um, then I think maybe because um, those pseudogenes have some very important or critical regulatory roles. Um, so that is why they kind of like remain so low variation. Um, and thus remain conservative over evolution. Um, so some future studies is that um, I want to quantify uh, the degree of this conservatory um, um, on the uh, Y chromosome. So I think maybe a sequencing the Y chromosome from some older human samples is the next step. And then I also want to classify what kind of um, like how those pseudogenes are getting into the y, y microsome, Y chromosome, and uh, whether it's classical or processed by um, comparing the um, sequencing data, whether there will be uh, non-coding segments such as introns in those pseudogenes. So in the end, I want to um, acknowledge that these two papers I got inspired about on this topics, and then I want to thank. Um, Dr. Dr. Hershey and um, and our TAs for teaching this class, and thank you all for listening. Any question? Thank you. Okay, continuing along.
Well, so close. <laughs> while we're loading up, my name is Minjin. I'm a second year um, MGM student in Amanda McLeod's lab, and I study um, in a antiviral um, defense in the skin. And I try to use a publicly available RNA-seq data that might be helpful for our analyses. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, um, Keratinocytes is a major subpopulation in the skin organ and epidermis, uh, in under epidermis, and they differentiate from the bottom layer all the way to the top. Um, and as they differentiate, um, the question that we wanted to ask is whether the differentiation itself um, bestows these keratinocytes and antiviral defense um, mechanism by um, producing some of the antiviral proteins. So. The data set that I was using is um, in vitro keratinocyte differentiation model where they added um, additional calcium that spontaneous, spontaneously differentiate um, keratinocytes into the more differentiated st um, states. So using different time points whether um, um, to look at whether the antiviral protein um, transcriptions upregulate it. So I got this cleanup data um, by somebody else but um, using this data, um, I, I had to do a lot of trimming and pulling these um, data sets together into one graph, one data sheet, and then cutting it down. So I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, I'm not gonna go through any of those, um, but first um, I collected, um, pull out some of the antiviral proteins and looked at um, how, they're, um, the, how the transcriptions are regulated. So I'm looking at, um, a differential gene expression that was um, controlled, um, normalized with the day zero, so undifferentiated state of these cells, and look at their um, transcript expression. And this is log two scale. And ideally, I wanted to connect these dot um, to have this like line, but because of the way my data was framed, um, I wasn't able to do that. And if somebody can help me, um, basically I had to do a um, pivot long to line them all of it, um, but connecting this to the next um, data um, was only, I tried hard, but it didn't work out. But what you can see from this is that um, compared to the earlier stage of differentiation, as the time goes on, um, the expression level goes up, and you can also appreciate that some of them actually goes down. So it might indicate that these um, antiviral transcription might be transient and it's only been expressed in the um, middle time of the differentiation and goes back down. So next, um, I decided to use the transcript transcriptomic data to plot a heat map. And I'm just gonna show you a several heat map, but here I throw all of these antiviral proteins as well as some of the differentiation markers that I already know that they should be upregulated um, using this in vitro differentiation model. And um, it's kind of hard to see, so I move on to another data. And finally, I landed onto another um, cool heat map where it's actually interactive and it shows you um, actual data, um, which is something that I've never thought of. I've never done R before. Um, so it's been two weeks since I've been able to do all of this. Um, so what I want to point out here is similar to the previous um, data point that we saw, there is this white up a blob um, where a lot of the antiviral proteins are clustered together and the expression compared to the earlier time points goes up and go back down and that's different from some of the um, differentiation markers that are already highly upregulated or it gets um, even more increasingly upregulated over time. So it really um, tells, um, um, supports the hypothesis that antiviral proteins are upregulated um, upon differentiation of these keratinocytes. And it's important because um, some of the anti, um, some of the virus is only um, able to target the basal keratinocytes with high, which are hiding underneath the actual um, impermeable barrier. Um, so follow-up study is, um, I would like to validate this RNA-seq data using my own in vitro study. Um, and I will do an 
RNA, um, qPCR to um, individually shotgun these um, proteins. And also, since it's um, regulated upon calcium signaling, I wanted to perturb calcium signaling pathways and see um, if it is indeed um, regulated by this calcium signaling pathway using a small molecule. So I thank you all for um, helping me learn about R and giving all these um, cool tools to be able to do all this nice visualization of this data. And um, I will take any questions. Uh, it was a code. It's a nice code. Um, it's called D3 heat map, and they actually give a pretty uh, nice um, introduction of what we can do. One thing they don't actually have is um, being able to add legends and have a title, which is very odd, but there are a lot of people complaining about it. But there are, I think, other interactive heat maps that we can use a lot. <laughs> so if you wrap your um, plot, if you assign it to complex use the GC plotting factor. All you have to do is do GC plotting and then the name of your plot and it makes it kind of flat. It'll override some of your um, uh, aesthetic features. Um, but yeah, it's, if, you, if you have a very if you have a basic GC plot and you want to make it interactive, you can use GC plot. Okay. How many people have not gone yet? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, so we're getting close to the end of time, like I thought we would, with a lot of students in this class. Um, do any of you five need to do a hard stop? Like class that you absolutely, like class mm -hmm. next that you have to do class? No. So if any of you have to leave um, before the presentations are finished, then go ahead and just quietly slip out. So um, we're getting close to 1140. So we'll stay. Don't worry, the, the five remaining will stay. Uh, and then as many of us will stay for you. Mine did this to me sitting over there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Hey everybody, my name is Luke and I'm in the La Spada lab where we study mechanisms of neurodegeneration. Um, for this final project, I used some of the um, data sets that Matt curated for us. Um, I was really interested in the subcell data set um, since it gave the subcellular localization of all these proteins. Um, and I tried to think about what questions I could ask about this data. Um, and so I started looking at some of the other data sets and Notice that this genes data set um, contained a common variable of gene name that I could join them. Um, and so I used interjoin um, to um, pull them together on the gene name category without like littering um, NA values throughout the final data set. Um, and I wanted to look at uh, how, like, upon each chromosome, what percentage of the genes uh, correlated to specific subcellular localizations? I thought that potentially chromosomes that evolved later in time would have different uh, percentages of organelles that evolved later in time. Um, and so my first attempt to make a stacked bar plot was a huge fail um, because the chromosome category was a character value. I think that was the main problem here. And I didn't actually have numerical values that assigned uh, each location within the chromosome. Um, so I did a count function to count the number of entries of uh, each compartment within each chromosome and converted it to a new converted this 
column to a numeric. Matt was talking about how um, there's a way to do that that retains all the information, but I unfortunately lost the X and Y chromosome after doing this. Um, also, the uh, there's a lot of those weird, uh, weirdly named chromosomes with like the underscores and stuff. And I didn't really know how to interpret those, so I just removed everything that wasn't um, like a single numerical value. And so this is my final graph. Um, which displays all the chromosomes and uh, yes, yeah, stacks a bar um, that's proportional to the uh, total number of the chromosome, which is just an additional line in the uh, the bar graph, uh, the ggplot bar graph. Um, and I picked a color scheme that was relatively easy to uh, look at and tried to mix with some conclusions. Um, you can see that the, the vesicle and vacuole are missing from multiple chromosomes, which was interesting. Um, and that uh, the Golgi and some other scattered um, compartments were also missing. However, uh, I took all of this with a grain of salt because of the data that I lost in merging my data sets. Um, so, to follow up, I would want to dig deeper into um, accurately merging these plots and also potentially taking into account uh, what Matt talked about of how proteins can often have high confidence scores to multiple um, compartments. A uh, big shout out to Matt, Akshay, and Ali for actually teaching the concepts of coding rather than just taking a textbook and putting it into a presentation and reading it out loud like I've experienced in the past. And a uh, big shout out also to Madison, who uh, helped me figure out some crazy problems with this. Thanks. Any questions? That's fine, you can just walk through the code. Yeah, so let's just go like this. And go like that. Okay. That's okay. Okay, sorry guys. For some reason, mine won't net. It gives like a really weird error. So if it like wouldn't knit because the date was? Yeah. No, it wasn't a date problem. She did a date problem. Yeah, it's a really odd issue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Either way. Um, so basically, I also, oh, um, my name is Hannah Schmidt. I'm currently a rotations, a first year MGM student rotating in the heat lab, and they study like virology and influenza. Um, so I also just used the data sets provided in the class, um, proteins and subcell, and I was interested in looking through the proteins data set to find this immunoreceptor tyrosine-based activation motif, which is involved in cell signaling in uh, immune cells. And um, so I just created a, a new data set for all the proteins that I found that motif in, um, and then I glimpsed it <coughs> there. Um, and then I was just like playing around with visualization to try and see what I could look into further um, here. So this is just the location and the length of the proteins that did have this motif. Um, and I noticed that they were pretty strongly localized within the cytoplasm, the membrane, and the nucleus. And I was only really expecting to see localization within the membrane because it was involved in cell signaling. Um, so then I looked at the go terms um, and I saw that there were only in this um, data set of about 191 proteins that had this motif, there were only 20 go terms represented. So then I found like a table online that has the go term associated with the like functional analysis since that wasn't provided. Um, and then I merged those 
um, to get and then graft it to get this, which has the um, the like go functional analysis associated with the 20 go terms that we saw. Um, and unfortunately, the top three are just like the localization, so I could have left it alone mostly. But um, I thought it was really interesting that the um, most returned go term was in the cytoplasm and not the membrane as we expected. Um, but there are some other go terms that weren't as frequently represented, like plasma membrane bound cell projection that fall right in line with um, this motif as a cell signaling motif in immune cells. Um, so basically the conclusions were that um, it was surprising to me that cytoplasm was the most represented go term and not mem membrane as I expected. Um, and that it'd be interesting to follow up to identify if this is a functional motif within like those cytoplasm proteins and choose like a number to look at and mutate the motif and see if there's like any functional event in cell signaling. Maybe it operates in more than one place. And just uh, thank you to Ali Akshay and Dr. Hershey. Just keep marching right along. Hi, um, I'm Veronica. I'm a first year in the PCB program. I'm currently in both Ed Levin and Stacey Bilbo's labs for a bunch of reasons. Um, anyway, I don't do genetics research really. I normally study behavior, and so I thought the easiest way for me to start looking at this data would be to find a gene that I was kind of familiar with from previous research, which is um, the CHRNA and B genes that encode cholinergic receptors. Um, but for simplicity, I decided to only look at the CHRNA genes. I took it off of uh, the Unipro database, found a bunch or a reasonable amount of hits. Um, and so what I wanted to do was look for the, I guess, the organisms that had a decent amount um, of genes that had been peer reviewed. And so from my list, you could see there are a bunch of random other organisms that we don't really study, like snakes and such. And so I decided to take all that out and simplify the names of the organisms using two functions I ended up creating. Um, and so I ended up with a table data frame um, that gave me my top six and in simpler organism terms. Um, and so at first I thought I'd look at gene links across species and I saw that they were pretty similar in terms of length, which is to be expected um, if they're named the same. Um, and so I thought, okay, maybe I could look at amino acids and see if specific organisms had an increased amount, which in retrospect, doesn't really make sense because if they encode the same subunits and receptors, they should be pretty similar, which is what I found. Um, and so this is my figure where it shows the amino acid spreads across all the different species I had looked at. And then to kind of just like lump it within the organisms instead, you can kind of see the distribution of all my amino acids were very similar. Um, and so I concluded from this that genes pretty conserved, or it seems very conserved across species. Um, and next steps would be to kind of look at the sequential arrangement to see if there are any differences for functional analyses and to kind of quantify CPG modification sites um, to see if there are any differences in epigenetic manipulations across species. Um, and so I'd like to thank the Hershey Lab, everybody in the class, a lot of coffee, and I'll take any questions. Nope. Okay.
Okay. Okay. Okay, so my name is Jana. Um, I'm in Nico Leptig's lab and I'm a second year. And I kind of use the data sets that we had to look at something that I'm, that I'm studying in my lab. Um, so I was looking at the location of proteins that have potential proleal hydroxylase motifs. Um, so proleal hydroxylation is a post-translational modification. It's basically um, the addition of a hydroxyl group to a proline. Um, and there's two different family of enzymes that perform this. So there's proleal 4 hydroxylase or P4H, which is primarily thought to be in the ER. Um, and there's proleal hydroxylase domain enzymes, which are thought to primarily be in the cytoplasm. Um, and so I was curious, they recognize different sequences. And so I thought maybe um, the abundance of proteins within different cellular locations would be different um, based on whether or not they have these motifs. And so I loaded the proteins data set. Um, and so I started by within the, the proteins data set, creating a new um, row to determine whether, uh, basically to quantify the number of P4H motifs found within the proteins. Um, and then I used filtering to create a new data set that only had those proteins. Um, and then I joined this with the subcellular location so that I could then create um, this new data file or this new like table, uh, which sorted everything by the subcell location. Um, and then this is the total number of proteins that have this motif. Um, and so when I plotted this, I thought it was interesting that even though, ooh, it's hard to see. Um, so even though P4H is thought to be in the ER, there's a lot of cytoplasmic proteins. And so I wanted to see if this type of trend with a lot of proteins in the cytoplasm um, was similar with the PhD proteins as well. And so basically I did the exact same thing looking for the PhD motif, which I'm not gonna show, but again, created this table um, where I have the location of the proteins and then the Oh, sorry. And then the total number. And this is actually for, um, I went a little fast. This is for all of the total proteins in um, the proteins data file. And so um, I couldn't figure, it took me a long time to figure out how to join three different data sets. And so what I ended up doing was uh, joining the P4H proteins, the PhD proteins together in one, and then added um, the total number of proteins by location to make a final data set. Um, and so my final result was this. I used um, the GD plot, like the geome point, because there's a single um, numerical value for every single compartment. Um, and I wasn't able to get a legend. I spent a lot of time, but I couldn't get that legend. But the, the purple is the total number of proteins, red is P4H, and blue is PhD proteins. Um, and so general conclusions overall, there's more proteins that have a P4H motif, um, which could be because this is only a three amino acid sequence compared to a PhD, which is about six amino acids that it recognizes. Um, it's also interesting to see that the so the subcellular location for both of these motifs does really correspond to like the total number of proteins within each compartment, which could be expected. But I thought it was very interesting that um, 
particularly looking at the nucleus and comparing it to um, this one, which is the membrane, there's like fewer proteins in the nucleus, but there's more that have this P4H motif, suggesting maybe even though this is an enzyme that we think of as being in the ER, maybe it's also acting on proteins that are in, go on to different subcellular locations. Um, and so to follow up, I would suggest doing like a bio ID tag of P4H to see what other novel substrates that we don't really know about um, that it associates with and figure out where those um, locations are. So with that, I'll take any questions. Well, I'm, I'm curious about the uh, same positive control um, question that I asked earlier, which was, um, you know, when you look at that, I mean, it's like 3,000 proteins in your first list with that um, three protein uh, or three peptide sequence um, a string lookup. Did you look through those to see if any of the known proteins came up and, you know, yeah, sort of so gut check? So collagen came up in your list, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys all for staying. Um, I'm one of the first year students in MGM. Um, right now I'm rotating in the Dr. Matsunami lab. Um, he does olfaction stuff, but that's actually not what he's talking about. I'm actually using one of my previous generated data that I collected earlier this summer studying um, zebrafish development that looks at um, how obesogenic genes in human affects health or affects development in zebrafish. Um, <clears throat> So these are the data that I collected. Um, just to quickly um, tell you guys what it's about. It has columns of the individual of the fish. Um, and then it also has the standard lengths, which is just their proxy for zebra fish height. HA being um, height from interior of anal fin, which is a proxy for their hip. Um, and fish 2D area is kind of our proxy for how much they weigh, because you can't really weigh zebra fish because there's water and stuff that sticks onto them, and their volume is just way too little to actually quantify. And beyond those measurements, we also have a last column of the allele that gets knocked out. These are all the alleles that's collected from human GWAS study that's been known to tie to um, obesogenic um, genes. Um, so first, I um, plotted um, the zebrafish for their standard lengths versus their 2D area. It's kind of like a proxy for um, their BMI, um, just because. And then we kind of see there's like a best fit line that kind of demonstrated the um, overall what wild type should look at. But I'm not really satisfied by it because you can't really tell which fish are influencing um, the trajectory of the growth and what are actually the mutants and what are actually the wild types in this graph. Um, so I use the um, facet wrap. And then here we can differentiate out between different genes in this cluster and how they cluster with each other. So here we have um, H and detail for HNR4 alpha and then all the et cetera, et cetera. We can see how they compare with each other. Um, you can't really tell clearly, but the darker dots are the data set for homozygous and the lighter spots within the graph are wild type. So in SEG, you can see a clear cluster of the two different cluster being separated. That kind of shows the developmental differentiation between them. But I also want to visualize <coughs> not just between clusters, but how well do these fish correlate in the whole population if they're actually affecting the gross length itself or not. Um, so I used a package that's provided also by ggplot. It's called Plotly. And here you can graph multiple dimensions together and you can just kind of see the clusters of them separating out to each other, which I thought was a really cool tool to use. And you can also zoom in and then look at specific clusters like how blue only clusters in the middle or how yellow 
um, the Qing yellow makes them deviate from the usual wild type path. Uh, so in conclusion, um, somebody should follow up with his genes and to look at what they actually do in human would be really um, useful for the medical field. And yeah, and I would like to thank Ji Plotly and all the people that developed the library as well as personal thank for um, Matt, Akshay, and Ali for making this course so fun to follow. It's only my first course learning program and I had a blast in it. And yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. How many mutants did you have? How many what? How many mutants? You have like I have a total of like eight. Eight? Mm -hmm. That's that should say. Last but not least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I can just click HTML so it doesn't have to knit again, right? Like it just yeah. uses the pre knit. Okay, cool. So, yay, and last one. Uh, my name's Chelsea. I am, whoa, what's that? Why is there a little thing? Don't worry about that. Okay. Uh, my name is Chelsea. I'm in the NOR lab. Uh, and I was determined to look at genes that somehow related to heat because my current project is looking at thermoplasticity of meiotic recombination rates. Okay. Uh, so I first started out with data at Uniprot. Um, I in lab, I work with Drosophila melanogaster, so I wanted to work with Drosophila melanogaster data. I did pull data. Um, it was really cool. They actually had temperature dependence data on genes, but then I only ended up getting eight hits, and I thought that wouldn't be fun to work with. So then I, I went and decided to use tidy biology data, um, specifically the genes data set. And so in case you didn't work with it, here are just the variables included within it. Um, and again, me on my determined path for heat, I decided to select out any genes um, that contained within their description the word heat. And then I use that to mutate the data set and then to have a column that's like true or false or NA based on if the description included heat. And so I pulled out a lot of like heat shock proteins and things like that. I went ahead and graphed um, all of the genes and colored them by if they included the word heat or not. I found that that was too many dots. So I excluded any gene that didn't include heat. Um, just looking for some type of correlation, because again, this was my exploratory. I thought it would be cool to look at GC content. And then I ended up just graphing transcript length to see if there was a relationship. Um, I thought that maybe it would make more sense to go ahead and look at genes if they were categorized as pseudogenes or not. And so, um, for my final graphs, I have like a couple final graphs because I ended up feeling like I did a lot of shallow exploratory and I kind of wanted to do more. So this is the first one where I categorized them by pseudogenes or not. And I thought it was kind of interesting that I had this clustering of pseudogenes at the bottom. I fit a linear regression, didn't see a relationship. I went ahead and checked. I got rid of those pseudogenes and went ahead and checked and still set a linear regression that didn't seem like there was a significant relationship. Um, and so really, one of the things I had started out on this project was I wanted to look at chromosome location and if there was a connection with GC content and something uh, with the genes being related to heat. And at first, I couldn't figure out a way to do it because, as someone mentioned earlier, the chromosomes had a lot of names. Um, and just to show you all the chromosome scaffold names, there were 400. So I thought that that would be really hard to figure out how to do that. But I ended up... Um, finding a way to pull out chromosomes that were simply labeled 1 through 22 and, in, and the X and Y chromosome. Um, excuse this figure. I ended up cutting this one. I didn't re it. That's my fault. But this is my final figure. And this one is where I categorized. These are all uh, genes related to heat. And then I plotted them based on which chromosome they were located in. And then also the amount of GC content for these heat-related genes. Um, and my conclusions from this is that I don't think that there's any relationships for anything that I did. Um, however, I think that I did get some good practice out of this in terms of how to manipulate data and to handle the data. Um, so again, no relationships. 
Um, but I do think it would be one of the things I noted at the end was that I had not normalized based on chromosome length. Um, so I thought that would be good to go back and do. And also that I work in melanogaster, I think it would be make more sense to go back and do this type of stuff within melanogaster. Again, because I'm working on a thermoplasticity project. Um, so I'm interested in seeing where genes relocated, where genes are located in, if they're related to heat. Um, I'm planning to do a GWAS later in the year, so I'm going to be trying to map some associates. So anyways, um, and acknowledgments, of course, Stack Overflow, the Hershey Squad, which is TAs and Hershey, and um, Karen Madison for helping me in class. And are there any questions? Yeah. Thank you all for sticking it out to the end. I thought it would be close. I was completely wrong. We weren't even close. Um, so um, actually, one thing, one uh, sort of final thought, um, you know, just, just to leave with, um, I guess that, that Chelsea said um, that she didn't find, you didn't find any uh, relationships. <laughs> and it actually reminds me back to the very first class where I started out by telling you a story about the names of things, right? And so the first step that you did was look at the name of something, right? Pull out everything that was named Pete, which I think, right, is a fine thing to do. Um, uh, but it's interesting that um, I don't know how you would, maybe through a screen, but how you would um, identify a priori genes that were associated or had something to do with heat, heat shock, heat, metabolism, heat temperature, tolerance, et cetera. Um, but uh, but it's, it just goes to, um, uh, back to the first story, which is uh, there's uh, naming things is not a good way to um, to uh, search for something. And so, um, really, what I hope is that you guys have some tools now that you can then continue on your own journey, especially for those of you who had zero experience at R before starting this. That you can continue on these things. Like you know about Google, you know about Stack Overflow, you know about uh, Madison, all of the resources that everybody <laughs> has used um, to. Uh, to, to really um, pull us off. And so uh, I'll remind you that you guys are also still on this Tidy Biology Slack channel. So if you guys have questions sort of along the way, go ahead and just post it there. And if you see questions there and you have an idea about how to do something, um, you can go ahead and, um, and, and chime in. So and we will, um, maybe not at uh, 2.45 a.m. last night or this morning. I don't know who that was, but um, I don't recall who that was. But um, yeah, we might not respond right away, but uh, we'll certainly try. So um, thank you all. Um, I had fun doing this. I hope you guys did too. Um, so then just a final reminder. We will look at your final presentations and your final um, uh, health file vignettes. Um, please turn in your justification for your grade and evaluation by the end of the week this week. And um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. So thank you all. All right, that wraps up Tidy Biology for today. Thank you for watching. And if you have any comments, go ahead, put them below. If you like us, give us a thumbs up. If you wanna see more of this, go ahead, hit the subscribe, and you'll see all of the videos that we post about Tidy Biology. Thanks, see you again.